one is the most famous insertion into the Bible? Ooh, ooh, the longer ending of Mark. Virgin birth, you got it. What? All that manuscript evidence that we have for Matthew and Luke shows that the virgin birth stories are original, so she must mean some other kind of insertion. Certainly not going to find it in the Gospel of Mark or Paul's writings, and it would take another 50 years before Matthew and Luke would first introduce the idea of a virgin birth. But Man, not another argument from silence. Just because a historian didn't write about something it doesn't necessarily mean that they believe that it didn't happen. At best, this is very weak evidence. Grafton's Chronicles mentions the reign of King John, but never mentions the Magna Carta. Seems like something you would expect to be mentioned. We have an extensive diary from the Civil War General Ulysses S. Grant. He says absolutely nothing about the Emancipation Proclamation, despite writing basically daily. That's a bit strange. Neither the Greek historians Herodotus or Thucydides provide any details about Rome or the Romans in their histories of ancient Greece. That seems to be like a pretty big oversight. Are you going to be like some of the other kooky TikTokers out there and say that Rome didn't exist too? There are also biblical scholars and not just desperate apologists who would argue that Luke and Matthew were written much earlier than the 80s. See Jonathan Bernier's book, which I will link in the description down below. This time, Christianity had left Jerusalem and headed into the Roman Greco world, where it was pretty popular to have this whole supernatural conception story. You know what else was popular in Jewish culture? Supernatural birth stories. Isaac was born when Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90. We also have supernatural birth stories regarding Jacob and Esau. Joseph, Samson, Samuel, John the Baptist. No, these aren't virgin births, but they are miraculous births, and this shows that this is a very popular theme in Judaism, not paganism. The pagan examples that she puts up on the screen here are not anything remotely like the virgin birth story that we find in the Gospels. Romulus and his twin brother Remus were conceived by a virgin priestess after the god Mars raped her and impregnated her. Hercules' mother was said to have caught Zeus's eye, and he pretended to be her fiancé and impregnated her. Asclepius was the son of Apollo and a mortal woman named Coronis. When Coronis had sex with a mortal man named Iscus, Apollo got extremely jealous and killed him. Coronis was then killed by Artemis for not being faithful to Apollo. Coronis was laid out on a funeral pyre and about to have their body burned, but Apollo rescued the child by cutting him from Coronis' womb. In other words, he was the first C-section. None of these are very convincing parallels. Raymond Brown is a well-known New Testament scholar, and he's famous for casting doubt on the historical accuracy of the gospel birth narratives. But even he thinks that these parallelomania theories are hogwash. In his book, The Birth of the Messiah, Brown writes, how attractive or acceptable would these pagan legends have been to Greek-speaking Jewish Christians? Would they have wanted to model the conception of Jesus after them? Many of the legends involved gross or amoral sexual conduct on the part of the deity who is thought to have begotten the child. In Wisdom 14.24-26 through 26, and Romans 1.24, show how Greek-speaking Jews and Jewish Christians would react to such conduct. The hilarious part is, is this adoption then disqualifies Jesus' claim to even be the Messiah because it makes his genealogy untraceable. Such Christians try to explain the whole genealogy thing because it's only through Joseph's line, not Mary's, do you get to the connection of King David. Numbers 118, father alone is tribe identification. Okay, come on now, seriously? Joseph is Jesus' adoptive father. He's from the line of David. Mary also is from the line of David. Law teaches that if a man dies, leaving no sons or daughters, the inheritance is passed on through the daughters and her husbands, provided that they marry within the tribe. Therefore, the daughter's inheritance is joined with her husband's. While this doesn't necessarily deal with genealogy, it does deal with passing on a family inheritance through a daughter, certainly a related concept. And are you really trying to say that Jesus is disqualified from being the Messiah because God is his father? Do you think that this technicality really amounts to much of anything? The Isaiah prophecy, it says Alma, young woman, not virgin. Canada, you really got to get grafted back into that olive branch because in Judaism, when a woman conceives on the first night of her wedding night, it's considered a miraculous conception, but certainly does not denote a virgin birth or no natural father's involvement. And the prophet Isaiah was Jewish. The whole book is Jewish. Okay, you went off on some tangent there at the end, and I'm not really sure that I'm following. But hold on for just a second. First, you said that the virgin birth was stolen from pagan myths and pagan stories. But now you're saying that Matthew mistranslated Isaiah, Jewish scriptures, and invented the virgin birth? Don't you see just a little bit of tension here? Pick a plot line! But let's talk about the Hebrew word Alma. The Hebrew word Alma occurs six different times in the Old Testament. Let's take a look at these passages and see if they could ever mean virgin. 
There's Genesis 24, 43, where Rebecca was Isaac's bride to be. In the same chapter, she's called a girl. She's also called a virgin. And in verse 16, she's called a maiden or Alma. All three words describe a virgin young woman. Exodus 2, 8, Miriam's sister Moses is called an Alma. She's living at home with her parents, so it's pretty easy to infer that she's probably still a virgin. There are some other passages in the Psalms and First Chronicles that are indeterminate. And then there's Proverbs 30, 19. This verse describes the way of a man with an Alma. In the context, Proverbs 20, 18 through 20 refers to four incomprehensible things, an eagle in the sky, a serpent on a rock, a ship at sea, and a man with an alma. What do all four things have in common? Well, they are all things that can disappear rather quickly. An eagle flies away from sight, a serpent slithers off a rock, and a ship disappears, and well, a virgin can lose her virginity in a heartbeat. That's what she said. (laughs) Dr. Michael Heiser is an Old Testament scholar with a PhD in Semitic languages. After reviewing these passages, he concludes... Quote, in ancient patriarchal culture, a woman of marriageable age like Mary was a female who would at least reach puberty and would be capable of bearing children. Daughters in such a culture were under close supervision and restraint. Even in today's sex-saturated culture, a significant number of girls in their teen years are virgins. How much more for those in a patriarchal culture? Matthew was raised in this culture, so it should not surprise us that he saw no incongruity with understanding Alma to mean virgin. The bottom line is that it's simply false to say that Alma can never mean virgin. A bunch of bad arguments against the virgin birth just doesn't make a good argument against it. 